It's been 50 years since then-Governor Endicott Peabody signed a bill creating a Boston campus for the University of Massachusetts, a move that came after UMass Amherst turned down more than 1,000 qualified applicants from the city. Since then, UMass Boston has evolved dramatically, moving from downtown to Dorchester, merging with Boston State College, and forging a partnership with the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. But the school's mission, marked by a staunch commitment to urban residents and issues, remains the same. For the past seven years, the school's evolution has been guided by my next guest, UMass Boston Chancellor Keith Motley. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. I am so grateful to be here with you today. Thank you for having me on your show. So I didn't know that whole story about Indicate Peabody. And he, so he went to the state legislature and he says, we gotta, we gotta do something more, we gotta. Well, gotta. what happened, he was prompted by two residents who happened to be partners out of Dorchester, uh, Robert Quinn and also George Keneally. George Keneally was the senator. Robert Quinn was also the speaker of the house and then went on to be attorney general. Both of them wanted to have an opportunity for those 1,000 students yeah. that weren't admitted to be able to trip over opportunity right in their neighborhood. And so the notion of the University of Massachusetts here in Boston mm -hmm. was born. So, I mean, for all these years, it's really had this urban commitment. I mean, it's, it's a commuter school, or it was. Now you've got dorms, it's growing, the campus is just stunning, it's gorgeous, got that new community center. Do you still consider yourself a commuter school? Well, we, we consider ourselves an institution that's serving all of the neighborhoods of Boston, but because of the 140 different um, countries that are represented mm -hmm. on campus, the 90 plus languages, our commitment to uh, the neighborhood hasn't changed, but we also know that we impact the world through the research we do, through the kind of teaching that happens on our college by dynamic faculty by all of those who happen to be employed at the institution that don't consider it work. They consider it <laughs> an opportunity to serve. And it's just an amazing community to be a part of and serve. Yeah, I'm sure you know this, but in, in other parts of this country, the Midwest in particular, public institutions are very popular and people are very proud of them and they're, they're anxious to get there. But in the Northeast anyway, maybe Massachusetts in particular, there's a bit of a snobby attitude towards them. I mean, well, is that because there are so many Ivy League institutions around here? What is that? Well, private schools had a tremendous head start. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they, they and, and they're wonderful institutions. But we're so grateful that we can offer the kind of excellence that we've been able to offer for one sixth of the price. You have access to opportunity and to excellence. But the amazing thing is that because of all the relationships, being the only public research mm -hmm. university in this great city, I benefit from having a Harvard and having a Boston University, all those wonderful institutions in this great city with me as partners in this effort. And so while they've had their head start, <laughs> they also understand the value proposition that an institution mm -hmm. like the University of Massachusetts here in Boston represents. So you've had, I mean, the state has cut back, I mean, I don't have to tell you, uh, funding for public institutions, and you've had to increase your fees. H has, that, has that leveled off? And well, the last that, two years we've been very fortunate. We've been led by President Robert Corrett, who's come mm -hmm. in, but we've also had a great governor and a legislature, and that legislative leadership, uh, both our speaker and both our Senate president have allowed for us to move back to what we call 50-50. 50% of what we will pay and 50% of what the state will pay. Now, it's a long way probably from where we were in the beginning, mm -hmm. but it also means that we can hold our tuition and our fees uh, and we don't have to raise those. For the last two years, we've committed to that. And so it's allowed for us to continue to be the kind of institution that those young people in the neighborhoods of Boston and beyond can come to and not feel that they will have to pay for the rest of their lives financially. 90,000 of our alumni are in this great commonwealth serving because they had an opportunity to go to the University of Massachusetts, Boston. So a lot of the institutions around here, Harvard, they're right here in our studio with us, uh, are doing online stuff, MIT. Is that a big push at UMass Boston too, or is it have become more of a more of a community, less of that? What, what, give us a sense of what that's like there. Well, we have, what's going on is that institutions have lots of similarities, 
But I think what distinguishes us is that our focus is on Boston and its great communities. Our research along the red line, starting at Harvard and going through MIT, is something that's been connected in the life sciences. I've had the honor of having the president of Harvard open up our Venture Development Center with me because she understood, President Faust understood what it means to have on both, all along the red line, opportunities for learning and opportunities for discovery. And so we're all in that mode of, of trying to develop the kind of um, young people and others who will go out and make a difference for this community, but also know that what we do here impacts the world. Boston is a tremendous place to be an educational leader. And so I have the honor of leading its public university with all of what you said. Public education is revered all over the country. And so in this great city, we're getting that. Mm. And I've been able to go beyond this, these borders to figure that out as well. So we were over in uh, Kendall Square a couple of weeks ago doing an innovation story. And one of the things that came up over and over again is that there are not enough people trained, you know, at a certain level to take the jobs that they're offering. And these companies are competing with each other, stealing each other. That's why they're trying to get all these non-compete clauses and everything in, into people's contracts. Can you help fill those kinds of gaps? Well, we've been very fortunate because they've discovered the University of Massachusetts, Boston as well. In the old days, all of the students that they would go after would be from the private schools. Now, companies like Sanofi and Genzyme and IBM, who we have a worldwide partnership around, creating uh, all kinds of adaptive technology and also helping them discover how to do that through the use of some of our students in their laboratories. It's been one of those things where um, our most recent accomplishments include those kind of relationships, internships, opportunities, and also leadership opportunities. They're discovering that we may come into your organization today in some support mode, but in the future we'll be leading those organizations through some of the innovative strategies, through some of the startup companies we're producing that also leave us and find their way to Cambridge. It's a great place to be. So you're growing and there's some other opportunities. You think you're gonna go buy the globe? Well, oh, so you're trying to get a scoop. <laughs> yeah. Listen, we would love to be across the street if the Globe wants to make that happen for yeah. us. Well, you could, yeah, somebody just put in my ear, you can make it an athlete's village for the Olympics. Well, listen, <laughs> there's lots of possibilities. And th your, this university is positioned to help in any way it can to help this great city move forward. We stand with the city of Boston and... We're, we're proud of that, and we're looking forward to all the possibilities. All right. Keith Motley, as always, thanks for coming. Appreciate it.